Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, a.k.a. The Doctor, here in studio with my co-conspirator, Mr. Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. The intrepid Scott Bernstein. And Benny's in the house. And uh, we just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and please subscribe to our podcast. Please follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we are on TikTok, and hopefully we'll be dropping some more clips on TikTok. We haven't been that active, but we are definitely active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We appreciate all your comments. Try to get back to as many people as we can. And uh, we've, we've got an exciting episode today, but before we get into that, I just wanted to take a moment, a minute or two, and talk to uh, the audience about uh, really introduce ourselves or reintroduce ourselves, because... Our podcast is growing, and that's a good thing. Our numbers are going up in terms of video and audio. And I noticed from some of the comments, uh, some people are like, who are these guys? And and sometimes they, they don't mean that in a kind way. <laughs> like, it's mostly the video, though. It's mostly video, yeah, right. It's mostly right. what we – because we're new to YouTube in the last yeah. five, four or five months. Yeah, so I think in fairness, it's a good idea for us to introduce or reintroduce ourselves just so you know – uh, that we're not just a couple of jabronis talking on. Maybe we are, but <laughs> but we do have some credentials. So um, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I am the reason why they call me the doctor. I have a PhD in the social sciences. I'm a criminologist at a university. I research, write, and teach about gangs and organized crime. That's my specialization. I wrote a book called Early Organized Crime in Detroit. So I'm really interested in organized crime in the mafia in Detroit, but also the Sicilian mafia in particular. But I research all sorts of other crime groups, street gangs. I've appeared in different documentaries about, about gangsters in Detroit, about Jimmy Hoffa. So um, that's who I am. And uh, my friend Scott Bernstein, you want to tell us? I wear bit? many hats. <laughs> um, right. So uh, at first I was a author. Um, I've published six books, uh, all on organized crime. I uh, started writing about organized crime in Detroit in the mid to late 2000s after I graduated from law school in Chicago. Um, published six books on organized crime, and then I have transitioned into uh, a career as an investigative journalist, documentarian, historian. Uh, I've been a, a part of a number of Hollywood television and, and film projects that I'm uh, started in about 2015. Been working in that space now for going on seven, eight years. Uh, I've had some viral hits on Netflix. I worked on a movie with Matthew McConaughey. I am now in the process of uh, selling a couple television shows to uh, Knock on Wood, Netflix, and CBS, uh, respectively. And still out there doing my uh, gangsterreport.com, www.gangsterreport.com. I started in 2014. It's uh, I call it the Rolling Stone of the of the, of the online magazine underworld. Uh, a lot of a hodgepodge of of uh, different organized crime subjects, kind of with with some pop culture and history sprinkled in. Yeah, I encourage people to check out Gangster Report because a lot of our episodes, Gangster Report inspires what we'll talk about here. But we only do this once a week. Like, there's a lot of other content. If you're interested in this topic, there's a lot of other content on Gangster Report that we aren't necessarily going to address here. Uh, address here. So if you want more of that, I encourage you to check out Gangster Report. And um, anyhow, so um, we hope that you continue to uh, like our show. I'm a podcaster, too, in case you yeah. guys didn't know. <laughs> That's We've right. had this podcast now going on three, four years. Yeah. Recently, uh, we, we spent the first two years building up our audio uh, audience. And then in the last five, six months, we've really made a concerted effort to get into YouTube and, and get in the visual space. So, Yeah, please spread the word. And, and I'm really humbled by it. I mean, when we first started this, I told Scott and Roberto back then, like, hey, if you know, a few dozen people listen to this. I'll be, I'll be happy. And then the first time Roberto told us like, Oh, like one of our episodes got like 10,000 downloads. I was like, what? Right. Like, are you, are you serious? So we've been growing it ever since and we're, we're happy to do so. And we appreciate your support. Um, so today's going to be another uh, La Cosa Nostra episode. So we're uh, going to be talking about the Italian mafia and specifically the Chicago outfit. A lot of our episodes on the Chicago outfit are, 
very popular, so we're happy to bring you more content. And uh, we have a couple of stories here that connect the outfit to their operations in Las Vegas. And we've we've talked about this before, and uh, we will revisit it. But some some other news that that has come out recently about the outfit and Vegas, although they're historical case studies, it, it's right. There are, the news are is kind of coming out now about two dead happened in the two past. dead bodies, right? One in the eighties and one in the two thousands, and they have uh, both of these cases have surfaced in the Las Vegas media uh, in the last month yeah um related to current well one's related to a current investigation and one's related to a family's plea for justice or attention to their uh father's uh suspicious overdose death okay so let's let's start chronologically what's the let's start with the tell us about the first one so uh if if people uh have been keeping track with uh our podcast we've done at least one or two episodes on all the dead bodies that are uh, emerging from Lake Mead in Nevada. Uh, it's the the major body of water in the Las Vegas area, the largest freshwater reservoir in America. It was created uh, as maybe a result, not for much longer <laughs> as a result of the Hoover Dam. Um, and since the 1940s, 50s, uh, there a lot of Las Vegas's problems have disappeared either into the desert or into Lake Mead. And uh, there's been a uh, a water drop um, in that area, and there's this precipitous water level uh, decrease that is causing human remains to surface. And there have been at least five bodies or five skel- skeletal remains, human skeletal remains, that have been uh, uncovered since early May. And there's a lot of speculation as to um, whether or not these are old cold case mob murders from the Tony Spilatro era. Um, And that was the character that you saw in the movie Casino. They called him Nicky Santoro in the movie Casino, played by the actor Joe Pesci. But in in real life, his name was Tony the Ant Spilatro. And uh, he ran roughshod through the Vegas Strip from 1971 when he landed there as a representative of the Chicago Mafia to look after the Midwest mob's interest in the casino and hotel industry. And he, he ruled for 15 years, was very, very high profile. Nobody uh, in Vegas had ever seen a gangster like Tony Spilatro. And uh, he died as he lived. Uh, it was someone that was suspected in upwards of probably three dozen gangland homicides, uh, some of them very brutal in nature. One of them you saw in the movie Casino, where they popped the guy's eye out in a head vice. Like, that really happened, and Tony Spilatro really did that. Um, That's one and, of my favorite scenes, by yeah. the way. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> not, I'm not to say like I like gruesome, like eyes being popped up, but the 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 dialogue. Yeah. You make me pop the, your fucking you me eyes me over that piece of shit, <laughs> Charlie M. Charlie M. You dumb motherfucker. <laughs> he said, "Kill me, Frankie. Do him a favor. Yeah, do him a fucking favor." Um. So oh, my mother. <laughs> so this this actually ties into the case that we're about to talk about. So in the movie Casino, there's a scene um, about midway through the film where you, you see that the Joe Pesci character's uh, reign in Las Vegas has gone off the rails, and there are bodies popping up, and uh, law enforcement scrutiny that wasn't there before he got there. There's media attention that wasn't there before he got there, and it's causing some consternation for the bosses back home. And uh, he sends his right hand, played by Frank Vincent, back to Chicago to meet with the, the Chicago mob boss who could give him a piece of the action. And while he's there, the, the, the mob boss in Chicago is supposed to be a, kind of a, a, a composite, but I think it's mainly supposed to be based on Joey Dove's Ayupa. Um, but in the movie, he's called Remo Gaji. And in the movie, Remo tells Frankie to kind of come closer and he says uh, they, they found a guy's head in the desert the other day. <laughs> Everybody's talking about it. It's a big deal. Yeah. He, and, he, and then at the end he says, now, go back to Las Vegas and, and you tell Nikki he's got to take care of things a little quieter. <laughs> right. Frankie, they found a guy's head in the desert. Do you know about that? Yeah, I heard, yeah. yeah. Everybody's talking about it. They're making a big deal out of it. I know. It's in all the papers. And I mean, that's no good. I know. You gotta tell him 
to take care of things a little better. Uh, so I didn't realize, I knew that there were a lot of murders that were depicted in the movie Casino that were based on real life. I didn't know until recently that that scene and that comment about a guy's head being found in the desert was another one of those cases. Um, and uh, the guy's name was Anthony Albanese. He went by the nickname Tony Paradise. Uh, he was a born and bred East Coaster that had come West in the 60s, had come in um, to Los Angeles, to Southern California, and owned a, um, a, a series of strip clubs. And then in the 70s, he moved to Las Vegas and started to, um, I guess, impose his will on the sex industry in, in Sin City. And uh, 10 years after he arrived, his head was found in the desert uh, in California with no torso, uh, no body attached to his head. That's what the Remo Gaji character was referencing uh, in the movie Casino. And right now... Because there's all these questions swirling around the bodies that have already um, emerged from Lake Mead, as well as predictions by environmentalists in Nevada that are saying, this is really the tip of the iceberg. And over the next couple of years, you're going to see dozens, if not hundreds, of human remains uh, surface. And it came out recently that one of the bodies or, or remains that they're hoping to tie and, and, and uh, I guess, close up a cold case murder um, is that the uh, authorities in Las Vegas are hoping that they'll find Tony Paradise's torso. The rest of him. The rest of him in Lake Mead. And that possibly some of the remains that have already surfaced since May potentially could, could be uh, Tony Paradise. So from a forensics perspective, I mean, if they find his body, I don't know. Well, how would you get the D? How unless they saved unless they saved the head? Yeah, in like a police freezer or an FBI right. freezer, which is fucked up. Or they could go to. I'm guessing they could go to his uh, offspring if he has any. Yeah, or brothers or sisters and get their DNA. So, but to to find it, are there? I mean, what would this do? Is this just about like some? Closure because it's so like um, I mean it's all, all these cases morbid like and, and you like to just know that his head was there but not the rest of his body like I, I guess I'm just without what purpose, being what purpose like so what if they find his right. torso what purpose is this sir right right um I don't think in any of these situations any of these bodies that they're looking for if if they were connected to mob hits in Las Vegas I don't think there's any way or any possibility that charges are going to come right. out of this. That's Nobody's right. yeah. building a case. There's not going to be homicide uh, indictments. I suppose for the family, if there's any family left, I mean, they might receive some kind of consolation, like um, that you can finally be buried in a proper, I don't know, like, you know, but it's, it's such a gruesome, gruesome thing. But the, the, circumstan yeah, the circumstances surrounding his murder are pretty interesting. Yeah, that's what I, I was just going to say. Let, let's get into that. Uh, I did a little research. I talked, uh, I reached out to some of my law enforcement sources in uh, that area and guys in the FBI, uh, or formerly in the FBI, a couple of guys that um, were in the Spilatro orbit. And uh, this was a, you didn't, you didn't really hear much about uh, beefs between mafia families in Las Vegas. And from our knowledge and our research, uh, and, and the historical record, most of the action that was going down in Vegas, not to say that there wasn't an a East Coast influence, there was, but the majority of the influence in Las Vegas uh, was from the Midwest. Right. Was Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Kansas City, St. Louis. Um, but New York still had their tentacles uh, stretched from the East Coast into the Nevada, into the Nevada game industry at some level. And Albanese, um, I think, represented, maybe not with the gaming industry, but at least with the sex industry, um, represented the, the, the five families, the, the New York mob. Uh, Albanese was representing some of their interests. And I know particularly he was tied into the Bronx crew of the Bonanno crime family. Um, Patty uh, DiFilippo, 
Vito DiFilippo, um, guys, Vinny Bastiano, uh, some some names that yeah. if you follow the New York mob, you know who they are. Right. And Patty DiFilippo, I think, was just a soldier at that point. His dad had been a, a capo under Joe Bonanno, I'm pretty sure. Um, Jimmy's more of an expert on um, I think, some of the Sicilian. I think, yeah, I think the old man was, yeah. And uh, so he represented the Bonanno crime family in L.A., or was one of the representatives in L.A. in the 60s. He had a, um, a strip club chain called Little Abner's, Little L-I-L. Abner's. I, I'm, I'm guessing that's based on the, the, the children's book. Yeah, I've heard that. Like, before. I, don't, I, don't I think it was like, like a comic city. Book I think it was like a city like... mouse or a, a country mouse, city mouse. Yeah, I don't. I've heard that before. But I don't remember what it was. I don't know if Abner was the city mouse or if he was the country mouse. Anyway, <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, he he ran those strip clubs in L.A. and according to some documentation I saw, he was not paying tribute to the L.A. Mafia. I see that in your reporting, yeah. Uh, so it, that's not to say that tribute wasn't being paid. Uh, the, 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 the documentation I said, or the documentation, no, I can't speak. The documentation <laughs> that I saw um, alluded to an informant saying that he wasn't sure that the L.A. crime family wasn't seeing anything. He just knew that Albanese personally wasn't kicking to the drag uh, crime family. That's not to say that the Bananos themselves were not paying the LA crime family some piece of what Albanese was giving to them. Yeah, they may, maybe they were making it right on that end. But that lays the foundation for when he came to LA, or sorry, God, I'm all over the place today. When he left LA and he came to Las Vegas in, I think, 1972, which was around the same time that Spilatro got there. Um, he purchased a strip mall known as Paradise Market. That's how he got the nickname Tony Paradise. At least in Las Vegas, he was called Tony Paradise. And uh, the strip club had, or sorry, the strip mall <laughs> had a strip club uh, in it called the Crazy Horse. The precursor to the famous Crazy Horse 2, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but the first Crazy Horse in Las Vegas was owned by Tony Albanese. And it did pretty well, but it was a, a, a small, kind of quaint, wasn't making a lot of noise, wasn't, I don't think, a, 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 a big wise guy hangout at that time, like it would become. And he was, he was uh, I guess, flying under the radar, so to speak, for his first five, six years, seven years in Las Vegas. But then he came up with a business idea um, inspired by what was going on in New York City where there were a uh, there was a, a sex club industry, like a mainstream sex club industry, not like not where it wasn't necessarily seedy and you weren't going to like a red light district, <laughs> but there were places in Manhattan. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on I know there was one that had a famous name. But they were high class clubs, and I think I think they were promoted as spa, co-ed spas. <laughs> I love the euphemism. And uh, you'd basically go and take your clothes off with other people uh, of opposite and same sex, and it would be kind of like a wink, wink, like you're coming here for a spa, but if you want to, if you want to become swingers, if you want to, you know, hook up and have sex here. Will also provide <laughs> provide those opportunities. Um, so I think that there was again I'm blanking on the name. There was a famous club in Manhattan that Albanese was inspired by, and then that club in Manhattan had spawned some knockoffs around New York City. And I'm um, thinking about the so if this is early '80s. The AIDS crisis had it was not before. It, it was before. before. This was '81. So you could you would. People maybe AIDS were less uptight about AIDS that. AIDS crisis yeah. really hit the mainstream in 84. Right. 84, 85. Yeah, because it seems to me like that that business model may have. Yes. <laughs> but it was very successful in New York City. I don't know for sure, but I would, wouldn't be shocked if some of the Bananos had a piece of those uh, oh, yeah. co-ed spas. Sure, of course. So Albanese had a, a open um, storefront 
in his uh, uh, Paradise Market, which was at the corner of Flamingo and Paradise Avenue. And he intended to open up the city of Las Vegas' first ever co-ed spa or underground sex club, however you wanted to, to, refer, to uh, refer to it as. And throughout 1980 and the early part of 1981, he wa- Tony Albanese was on a um, fundraising campaign where he was selling shares of the club for uh, you know, financial investment to wise guys. So this sounds more like a swingers orgy kind of thing because we knew there were like uh, what do they call them stud ranches or whatever. I mean, yeah. there were brothels going right. back forever yes. in Las Vegas. This is a little this different. This is for swingers. This is for right. This is more of a collective yeah. community uh, communal. I think it was for husbands and wives <laughs> or boyfriends and girlfriends to go yeah, right. and swap. Right. <laughs> right. Um, did it look like a club? The one in New York did. I think it was called Plato's. Closet, or I, I, I don't like the philosopher. I don't. I, I, if you told me the name of it, I, I would remember. I should have done my research before we um, got on the air, but I, I didn't. I apologize. But, but there was a precedent. Look it up on Google. So when your <laughs> your fiance when he looks at your phone, <laughs> Scott's looking up New York sex. Club. There was some um, precedent in terms of successful business en- endeavors in that space in New York. Again, I'm speculating, but I'm guessing that the. Italian mafia had something to do with either financing so. or overseeing or extorting. So Albanese decides to take that concept, bring it to, uh, bring it to Las Vegas. And at this point, uh, Spilatro wants in. And I, again, I don't know all of the particulars of what was going on before that. It doesn't sound like Albanese was kicking up any tribute to the Chicago guys in Vegas. It looked like, again, like w- what he was doing in, La- uh, in Los Angeles where he was relying on the Bananos to run interference for him. Um, but when word starts to spread on the strip that this is going to happen and people know it, or people were assuming, I guess, it would be a successful endeavor and it would be profitable. Um, I think he was looking at initially to raise a quarter million dollars. and. Uh, at some point, according to informants, Spilatro approached Albanese and said, we're coming in for a piece of this and we're not paying. We're not giving you any money to invest in it. We're just taking a piece of it. And Albanese didn't take kindly to that uh, conversation based on some people I spoke to and some stuff I saw. That's not saying that he was definitely killed by Spilatro. We don't know exactly who killed him. Um, but I, I would lean towards believing that yeah. that, is, that, that incident, that dispute um, is what led to him being murdered. And, and it doesn't seem on brand, like a head in the desert. doesn't seem like on brand for Spilatro. Yes. I mean, we don't, obviously we don't know. But it doesn't seem like it would be on brand. So – let me ask you something, uh, and just for some context here, I, because I think this is an interesting story. Spilatro's initial assignment is to protect Rosenthal and the skim. Right. But as we've established in other episodes, when he goes out there, he doesn't, he doesn't just confine himself, restrict himself to that. He views it as an open city, yeah. and he wants a piece of everything, breaking and entering, theft, there had never theft, been uh, gambling, loan sharking. There had been mobsters that had drugs. been in Las Vegas before, but right. the mobsters were focusing on the stealing that was going on in the casinos. Right. There was nobody that was, like you're saying, looking at it as an open city to go in and conquer. Yes. And cut into all the illegal business being operated on the street. Street and, level, right. And if you don't let us cut in, we're going to cut your head off or yes. we're going to murder you. Right. So this was, this was kind of an interesting dynamic separate from his initial assignment from the outfit. And you can see why some of the guys in Chicago would get annoyed with him, not only generating headlines, you know, ahead in the desert, but like um, in this case, maybe um, uh, getting into causing some beef with another crime family that then Chicago has to settle this because I can imagine this Albanese guy, if he, if he, if he thinks 
he's protected by the Bananos, he might not even know who Spilatro is. And he might, he might well, be yeah. like... I would say, he, I mean, maybe when he first got there. Yeah. But he'd been there for seven years. Yeah. He opened up... Uh, he, he purchased this uh, strip mall, um, I believe, in 79. So he would, he would have known who he was, but he might not have been like... But he'd um, been there for seven years before. Yeah. But, operating, you know, on the fringes of the strip club industries. But you know how these guys are. Like, if they're protected by some other wise guys, he might be like, I, I don't have to fucking pay you shit. Um, not maybe appreciating how lethal Spilatro could be. So, ac- according to one of the documents I was given by um, one of my sources, a uh, former FBI agent, this informant says there was some type of sit down in March of 81 between the Spilatro group, Albanese, someone from the Bananos that had come in town. Um, I'm, lead, I, I'm, I'm, I'm of the belief that it was uh, Patty from the Bronx, Patty DiFilippo. This is what the informant thought it was DiFilippo. Uh, and then there was also members of the L.A. crime family that were at that meeting. Interesting. So I guess the murder could have been uh, carried out by the L.A. family as well. And because this world is so treacherous, I'm totally speculating. I've no, I've not done any reporting on this. Just asking Scott what he thinks. To me, there's always a possibility that they all agreed behind the scenes. All right, we're gonna fuck this guy. We're gonna cut this guy out. And <laughs> Spilatro Bananos will just like you want to fucking whack this because he, he's not a made guy, right? Right. The Bananos could have sold him out. I don't think th- Albanese was a made guy, right? I, I don't see any evidence I've never telling seen his me name before that he's a May guy, but that doesn't mean that yeah, yeah, he right, could have been, but right. there's no evidence to tell us that he was. Yeah, so if he was a May guy, then that then what I just said, that would become more complicated and may not be the case. But if he's not a made guy, who knows? Maybe even the Bonanos sold him out and uh, made some arrangement with Spilatro. And it's like, uh, but the co-ed spa never got built or opened. Oh, that's that's true, yeah. Yeah, and... Um, Which would defeat the purpose of any kind of like, We'll split it among ourselves. And and please, if you're um, if you're from Las Vegas and you're watching this or listening to this, please correct me if I'm wrong. But um, at the new shopping plaza that Albanese opened up when he first got there, and he opened up this crazy horse saloon that was a uh, a strip club, he had taken over a piece of property that was known as Billy Joe's Power Company. And I guess in the 70s, this piece of property uh, was like, if not the hottest disco in Las Vegas, one of the hottest discos in Las Vegas. So it was like, a, it already had like a reputation as a hot spot. Yeah. Um, and that can actually be a segue for us into the second uh, Chicago mob Las Vegas tie that we're going to get into today. Is well, that... well, let me, I'm sorry, yeah, I, because ahead. I just want to finish this up. I, yeah. I want to ask you one more thing. So it's the protocol. Like, okay, let's assume he's an associate of the Bananos. Spilatro whacks him without clearing it with, with New York. And the Bananos find out that they're probably not willing to go to war over something I like wouldn't... this. But I mean, what would be the protocol? Like, would the Bonanos then say you have to you have to reimburse us? Remember, like uh, in Sopranos, like it's all business. Remember, they they beat the guy up and put him in the. It was Hesh's Hesh's uh, <laughs> son-in-law. And then uh, he's like, "Now can we get around to something, something more, more important? important? <laughs> yeah. You want ten thousand or whatever? Fine. Like we. Can I mean, that's how it would be. Like no one would shed tears in that world, but they would. Wouldn't they expect some kind but, of compensation? Yeah, but I think back up for a second. I think I don't think Spilatro or Chicago would have been brazen enough to hit a member of Bonanno crew without clearing it with the Bonanos. So then the Bonanos did throw, they I, did sell them out. Well, again, I'm, look, I'm also looking at my reporting here. According to the ad informant, at that sit-down in March, Albanese got quote-unquote mouthy. Ah, I see. Now, I don't know what that means. He got mouthy with Spilatro. Does that mean he got mouthy with the L.A. guys? Does it mean he got mouthy with his own guys yes, in the Bonanos? right. I can see. Um, we we talked about this in another episode. A lot of the time, when these guys get clipped, it's overdetermined. It's not. It's not always just one right. specific. It, it's a. It's a culmination of infractions, and then there's one that's a catalyst where it's like, all right, I, enough for this fucking guy. 
So Albin, oh, so this is the, uh, I'll, I'll end uh, with this. Albanese um, disappeared on uh, May 18th, 1981. Uh, he was at home with his wife uh, in, in their house in Las Vegas on, on Bel Air Avenue and uh, told her that he was going to a meeting and that the meeting should last less than an hour and that he'd be back uh, for dinner. Never returned. They found his body in, or sorry, they found his head in California. They didn't find it in Nevada. So he was kidnapped from Nevada or killed in Nevada and his head placed in California. Um, another interesting aspect of this was there, you know, it doesn't look like there's any direct connection, but there could be some tangential connections to the fact that two other underworld figures uh, that were from Southern California, but were doing business in Las Vegas, the same way that Albanese was, um, were killed the same time period. Mm. Were killed in early summer, late spring, 81. Um, so when, when uh, investigators have been looking at Albanese's case, uh, besides speculating about the connection to Spalatro or Chicago. Um, they also uh, have looked at if it ties into these other two uh, uh, underworld figures that uh, popped up dead. But if, if Spalatro is, would you say he's by 81 totally rogue yet? He was headed in that direction. Because I'm saying like if, he, if, if that's his, that we know that he was having that problem. It's not unimaginable that he could have whacked a banana right. associate without getting without checking in. With yeah, but I I I feel if that happened, there would have been blowback that I, I we see. would know about now. I see. Okay. I could be wrong. I mean, sure. it might have been blowback that got stomped out really quick, and it never reached the point where someone like me would have heard it. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's interesting. I I find it. I just find it difficult to believe, as crazy as Splatra was. I mean, that would, you'd, you'd be risking a, a bi-coastal mob war. Right. If you kill the New York mobster on the Chicago mob's watch without permission. Maybe this is what triggered the war between Chicago and the Bananos that you read about in Romer's, <laughs> Romer's War of the Godfather. I swear, when, war I of the Godfather. when I was reading that for the first time, I, know, I was like, too. how do I not know about this? I know. I've, how I've, have I never heard about this? I read it in high school and I was blown away. I was like, why did this never been addressed? Why did this be other... made into a movie? <laughs> right. Benny doesn't, Benny probably doesn't know what we're talking about. Bill <laughs> Romer and people that are listening to him might, might not know what we're talking about. Yeah. Bill Romer was a famous FBI agent that was kind of Spilatro's main nemesis um, in the FBI. And he was a bit of a glory hound. Sure. And when he retired from the Bureau, he wrote a handful of books on the Chicago Mafia. He wrote one on Spilatro, which was great, by the way. He yeah. wrote one on Tony Accardo, which was great. Mm -hmm. But then he wrote another one without really letting people know it was fiction. There's no disclaimer. <laughs> and it was about this like mob war between New York and Chicago and all these real life <laughs> people. And he's like talking about like FBI wires and and informants yeah. and I'm and Mark I Dalitz gets killed right and I'm just like wait this ne this never really ha this never happened and, I was and so you confused. do a little research on it you're like oh it's fiction yeah I was so I read it when I was probably 15 or 16 I was so confused I was like how wh why wasn't this addressed in any of the other books that yeah. I had read I was blown away um, so anyhow sorry to digress but but yeah so tell us about the the, the second second. So study. the so the Crazy Horse Saloon that Tony Paradise Albanese opened up um, in 1979, he died two years later. It was killed two years later. Uh, by 1984, uh, the Crazy Horse had been moved. Uh, let me go back and see where it was moved to. It was moved to um, industrial. Uh, the uh, industrial in Sahara. Um, it was underneath, I think, a, 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 a Sahara uh, Boulevard overpass. Yeah, I just tried to look it up on Google. I can't really figure. I, I haven't been to Vegas in years. I, I don't really know that area, to be honest. I've only been there a handful of times. But um, I don't know where it is. So the original one was on Flamingo in Paradise. And then the second one was on a piece of property known uh, by the, uh, which was at the corner of Industrial Road and a highway overpass uh, that was Sahara Avenue. 
that became the Crazy Horse 2, which became quite uh, notorious, at least in my early trips to Las Vegas. Um, that was uh, a, a kind of a go-to strip club. Um, it was the one that everyone said the mob controlled. And whether or not that's true, I guess is neither here nor there, but it was kind of one of the last, uh, it was, it's, I believe it's closed now, but, uh, up until recently, it was known as like one of the last vestiges of mob control over Las Vegas, that there was still a business in the two thousands, um, operating and it wasn't a, uh, kind of a, uh, profit sharing. It was the Chicago mafia has full control over, according to some informants and documents, again, nothing has ever been proven, um, but that uh, the Chicago Mafia controlled, 100% controlled the Crazy Horse 2 strip club, which became one of the more popular, um, trendy strip clubs in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And um, there were quite a few Chicago wise guys and Chicago wise guy affiliates that were employed at the Crazy Horse 2, most notably Joey the Clown Lombardo's brother, Rocco. So, Benny, you're always balling out in Vegas. Is that strip club still there? <laughs> so that strip club was owned on paper by a Chicago businessman, um, eventually a uh, convicted felon, but at the time, a Chicago businessman named Rick Rizzolo. Uh, and uh, Rick uh, got into a dispute with his tenant. Um, so Rizzolo owned the strip mall that he had bought from whoever Albanese had, whoever had inherited it after Albanese yeah. died. Um, and there was a um, very colorful Las Vegas businessman by the name of uh, Buffalo Jim Barrier. And Buffalo Jim Barrier was a very, very colorful, connected, um, someone that was known around town as kind of a uh, ambassador of Sin City. And um, he was also, uh, uh, he owned an, uh, an auto repair business that also doubled as a memorabilia um, pawn shop. And it was in the same strip mall as the Crazy Horse 2, which again, had become an incredibly popular strip club. So this Buffalo Jim Barrier, who had this auto parts, auto repair store, that again, doubled as a place where people would go and try to sell wrestling memorabilia, professional wrestling memorabilia. So kind of think of like Pawn Stars uh, where people would go and try to sell things to those two guys in Las Vegas. Yeah. And then they would turn around and... When would this have been again? This was in the um, 80s and 90s and early 2000s. Wow. And it's interesting because I'm not sure how much wrestling memorabilia there even was. At well, that point, okay. You know? okay. So I don't know the time on this. The, the wrestling memorabilia part might have started to come L later. more later on. That would make sense. He... he uh, I believe he put the um, auto repair shop in there in the 70s. Okay. And then at some point, uh, Rizzolo takes over the Crazy Horse 2, and there starts to be landlord-tenant disputes. Buffalo Jim, in addition to having this auto repair, uh, auto parts company, uh, storefront, sold and traded memorabilia, he also had his own promotion. Oh, yeah, wrestling yeah, promotion. promotion. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so he had a, a small independent wrestling promotion in Las Vegas that had a television deal and that was on cable television. Yeah. So he was this, I keep on coming back to the word, word colorful, but I mean, he was this like larger than life, crazy, like your crazy uncle. Um, and, he, and he looked the part. He had a, you know, looked like a, almost like a, a biker 
with a long beard and tattoos and he was um, a popular guy too right yeah very popular we did commercials on television for his auto repair shop and um starting in the 1990s rick rosolo tried to kick buffalo jim barrier off the property to expand the strip club, or do we know why he wanted? Yeah, I'm not sure him out of that. But he started to, and Buffalo Jim had opened up the shop in 1977, so he was there for a good seven years before Rizzolo took over. Um, Rizzolo took over in '84, '85. By '95, '96, Rizzolo is trying to remove Barrier from the property. And Barrier um, claims renters' rights says, I own this before you bought it, goes to court and gets the, um, the uh, proceedings to evict him stayed. And it becomes a 10-year bitter feud uh, between Rizzolo and the strip club and Barrier. Um, and according to Barrier's family and Barrier's attorney, over those 10 years, there was a, a campaign of intimidation that was launched by Rizzolo and the strip club. Death threats, uh, flat tires that had been slashed, graffiti art being put on uh, pieces of property that, that Mr. Barrier uh, owned. I mean, if he's a good paying tenant, I have to imagine their main thing was they probably just wanted the to expand the wanted the space to expand the expand the strip right. club, right? Okay, there's there's another kicker here. <laughs> the kicker is that through this eviction process, Buffalo Jim starts cooperating with the FBI, the DEA, and the IRS against the strip club, against Rizzolo, and isn't really trying to hide that fact. He's using it as leverage to get them yeah. off his back. Yeah. Because um, the FBI and the authorities in Las Vegas were convinced that Rizzolo was a part of a racketeering enterprise, was using the strip club to run drugs or to um, launder money. None, none of this is, be very clear, none of this was ever proven. Right. It was, was ever proven. Um, but, uh, it, it, and part of this started um, back in. Uh, the early 2000s when a uh, customer at the, in September of, of 2001, so I think it was right after 9-11, uh, a customer at the Crazy Horse 2 got into a dispute over his bar tab with some of the security and the security beat this guy to death and threw him out on the curb. Buffalo Jim Barrier used that incident as a way to kind of show Las Vegas, that, hey, these are a bunch of bad guys. They're killing mm -hmm. their customers. <laughs> um, two years later, the feds raid the uh, Crazy Horse 2, and they're just, they're just coming full court press at Rizzolo. Um, eventually, Rizzolo ends up copping a plea to tax evasion in 2007 has to sell, uh, I believe, his ownership stake in the Crazy Horse 2, and has to go do a year in prison. On April 4th, 2008, Rick Rizzolo is released from prison, and 48 hours later, on April 6th, 2008, Buffalo Jim Barrier is found dead um, in a Motel 6. The authorities ruled that it was a cocaine-induced heart attack. The Barrier family and the Barrier attorney is convinced that this was a message murder, that Rizzolo in the Chicago outfit had killed Barrier, had hot dosed him, and that it was a message because it happened, you know, a day or two after Rizzolo had gotten out of prison. So that was the news that hit the Las Vegas press about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Uh, Jim Barrier's daughters, two daughters, did an interview with the Las Vegas uh, 
review journal. Are they filing like a, an unlawful or what, what's the term? Like I think a, they're just plead, unlawful death. Or I think what, they're, what ple- they're pleading for some type of follow up investigation by the Clark County coroner's office or the Las Vegas police or the FBI. You know, the the Las Vegas Review Journal reached out to them for the story and they said, it is what we say it is. It was a accidental overdose and there's no foul play and we don't intend on going back. And it seems to me like a long shot. I'm not, I'm not trying to disrespect the family. I mean, it's a sad story, but if, if they can demonstrate that at any point in time, this guy was doing cocaine. Yeah. Like there's plausible to not like, like sometimes that happens, you know? And this so. guy, let's also paint the picture of, of Buffalo Jim. I mean, this guy was like, in the world of wrestling, you might not have known him across the country, but when anybody of any stature, at least of people that I spoke to, because I didn't know who this guy was before I heard, sure. <laughs> I heard about this, but from the people I spoke to, and you could tell by just Googling him and, and looking at a Google image search, any major wrestlers that came into Las Vegas in the 90s and 2000s were pain we're, we're like taking a pilgrimage yeah to this auto parts store like a destination to come place. take a picture with buffalo jim maybe sign some memorabilia interact with fans that were coming there to sell and trade wrestling memorabilia so i mean he was like this figure that maybe a majority of the world hadn't heard of but in certain spaces in certain circles he was a pretty popular renowned, dare I say, even iconic uh, figure in, in certain places. So um, do you think law enforcement in that area are interested in this, taking it seriously? No, or I don't. And, uh, you know, I don't know what to believe. I, I am someone in, in my crime reporting. I don't believe in coincidences. I don't believe when someone ends up dead on a, a certain date or close to a certain date that it wasn't intentional. Now that said, this is very thin. I mean, he yeah. had a cocaine. I mean, he had a, a cocaine induced heart attack. Is it possible that that someone hot dosed him? I know they're saying that he was at that Motel Six with a woman he didn't know very well. Maybe the, I think they're implying that this woman might have been hired to hot dose him. Um, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem very. It doesn't seem like there's a very strong case no. for this being a mob hit, other than the fact that the timing is strange. Yeah, the timing is uh, is uh, interesting. But again, you know, in terms of any kind of evidence, I mean, if this if this guy liked doing coke, and he's with some, we don't know that. You know, I don't. I don't want. I don't, no, wanna, I don't want to make assumptions. Yeah, yeah, we don't know like, that. My gut tells me. <laughs> And I and I apologize if his family's listening to this and 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 he's and he's nothing like this. I don't know anything about this guy other than what I've written and what I've talked to a couple people uh, in the Las Vegas press as well as a couple people in the in the uh, uh, that were former feds. So I, I apologize if this comes off like I'm talking like I don't know what I'm talking about. But he seems like a guy that liked to party. Right. That that's why I'm. I'm so I don't know. I don't know if he had. A, I, fair, but... I have no idea if he had a recreational cocaine habit. If he had a uh, cocaine addiction, I have no idea. Right. It looks like, based on the pictures I've seen and the way he presented himself, as he was a guy that liked a good time. I mean, if you're a guy with someone that you taken a woman to a Motel Six, it doesn't seem to me a stretch that you you like to use cocaine. Too. You're going there to have sex and, and to do drugs. Right. It seems like they go they go well together. But um, but if I was their family, I would be very suspicious oh, the of the time, fact yeah, that it happened. You know, less than two days after this guy that had a real hard on for my dad. Yeah, this guy gets out of prison, and then you know, within two days, my dad's dead. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it, it's an interesting story, but it seems to me right now it's too thin in terms of. No, it's definitely too thin. I it, would never, um, yeah. I would never say or imply that that there are you know charges on the horizon or a ca- even a case that could ever be built. Right. But I found it interesting. the The Las Vegas uh, Review Journal put this on their front page. This Buffalo Jim guy, obviously, um, you know, was was relatively high profile. 
Uh, so was Rick Rizzolo. So you had Rick Rizzolo. I don't know if it's Rizzolo or Rizzolo. Um, but you had, you know, two of Vegas's maybe most uh, colorful characters, sure. most, um, you know, infamous um, people that were butting heads for a decade. And, and one ends up in, in prison and one ends up dead of an overdose. One had helped put the other in prison. You know, it definitely leads to some questions to be asked. Uh, I'm again, I'm more interested in kind of who this Buffalo Jim was and yeah. and and what his um, how all these wrestlers knew him. I don't think that like he was getting mainstream uh, household names to no. come wrestle on his circuit. Yeah, sometimes in that case, you get like some has beens. You know that I don't, I don't think it, back in the day. It wasn't. But, it wasn't any uh, company that had a national television. Sure, deal. they had a local television deal. Yeah, a lot of times because those those guys uh, once McMahon cut you loose, those guys didn't make any money, yeah. and so they would some of those has would. But hit but the, local but the point circuit. I'm making is that a lot of these, you know, legendary wrestlers knew who this guy was, yeah, yeah. and and appeared to really like him and enjoy his company. I mean, uh, just the picture that I put up on my website when I recorded or when I did this story, um, you know, he's with uh, Goldberg and um, Sid Vicious. Sid Vicious. And was that Rick Steiner? Yeah. And Rick Steiner. Yeah. WCW guy. Well, the Sid Vicious was in back and forth, but um, so one of these days we'd like to do a wrestling episode because there's, there's a couple of really interesting in Canada, Dino Bravo, yep, and then Johnny K Nine, which was Outlaw Bikers, and yep. then Dino Bravo had connections to the Catroni Rizzuto those, yep. uh, organization of Montreal. Uh, both guys died under, you know, uh, well, Dino some, Bravo was like stealing cigarette shipments that, are, yeah. that he was supposedly in charge of. Yeah, and... so there it could have been multiple people that wanted to, to, to see him dead. Yeah, but please, please Google this Buffalo Jim because he he looks like something straight out of a WWE storyline. Yeah, I thought he was Cactus Jack at yeah. first when I uh, when I saw that picture. But if anyone out there, by the way, if there are any wrestling people out there that like wrestling, like I mean, we used to. I don't follow wrestling anymore, probably in twenty something years. But loved wrestling in the eighties yeah. and nineties and early two thousands. But um, if you could think of any good guests that we could contact to come on our show and talk about. Dino Bravo, Johnny K9. Let us know because I don't know anyone in that world to like we 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 have networks within law enforcement and the underworld, but I don't know anyone to talk about wrestling. But we'd love to do an episode on the I, wrestling I, underworld crossover. I'm going to digress here for a quick second, but this isn't really crime related, but it's fascinating to look at these wrestlers that I grew up watching in the 80s. That were, you know, these again, larger than life. You know, I had their action figures. And the lifespan oh, of yeah. these guys. Sad, they yeah. all die at like 50 or 45. I mean, yeah, true. steroids and cocaine are, are a really, really brutal combination yeah. on the body. And if you look, and I don't want to throw out a crazy estimation, but I mean, you're talking maybe 30% of the guys that were wrestling in the 80s are gone now. I would say more than that. Maybe even. more, yeah. When I watch, like, I like to watch old-fashioned wrestling. Even now, I'll watch, I'll text Bernie, like, in the summer, I'll binge, and I'll <laughs> watch, like, WrestleMania from 88 or whatever, Royal Rumble or whatever. And um, I'll text him, like, I can't believe, like, almost every one of these guys in these matches is dead. Dead. Right now, and yeah. and they died a long time and they ago. They die young, not, not just like the other day, but like right. and they died die young. in the '90s and, and like the early 2000s. So it's sad, but hopefully we 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 find this topic interesting. Hopefully we can expand. I know it's it's a little different than the what happened in Chicago, but it, his connection to wrestling made me think about this other and, this other and, stuff. And right now, you know, uh, Rick Rizzolo, you know, he's 66 years old. He's still living in Las Vegas. Uh, he's been out of you know, he's been out of prison now for. 13, 14 years. Uh, we don't really, you know, I haven't really kept tabs on him since the Crazy Horse 2 closed. But, uh, you know, again, I want to make very clear that we're not uh, impugning him. We're just saying what was alleged by uh, Buffalo Jim's family and by uh, some investigations into him. But uh, has never been convicted of any racketeering or mob-related counts and was, uh, was, was convicted of, of tax evasion. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if you're employing 
Joey Lombardo's made man brother. And Joey Lombardo was the conciliary of Chicago Mafia, uh, recently died, a legendary figure in, in the Midwest underworld. Was He was actually in charge of Spilatro. So Spilatro in Las Vegas reported to Lombardo in Chicago, and then, Lombar- and then Lombardo reported to the bosses. Lombardo was a capo at that point, ran the West Side Grand Avenue crew. Then she became conciliary in the 90s. But uh, <laughs> he sent his brother to work at the Crazy Horse too, um, and his brother is allegedly a made guy. Mm. So you do the math. Um, the the club in its heyday was very mobbed up, and it was known as a place that if you were a gangster that was coming in from out of town. You weren't going to Spearmint and Rhino. <laughs> you weren't going to OGs. You were going to the Crazy Horse too. You weren't going to the Seven Seven Seven. What's, right. What was the Death Row? <laughs> the uh, Suge Knight. The Suge Knight one. <laughs> six, six, wasn't it Six 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 Club? No, it was I think I thought it was Seven. Were, were the party that Pac was going to that? Yeah, night? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I can't 740 remember. Seven Forty Club or something. <laughs> right. So I mean, I, I just want to make clear that yes, they were allegations, but. That's a fact. Rocco Lombardo was employed by the Crazy Horse too. There's pictures online. Is he still around? He'd yeah, he's, al- he's still alive. He's still alive. If you, if How you, old? He'd be he's in his, and he was younger than Joey. He's probably oh. in his mid eighties, early eighties. Yeah, okay. Joey died when he was eighty nine in two thousand eighteen or nineteen. Um, but you know, you can just Google Rocco Lombardo. There'll there'll be a picture that pops up with him at the Crazy Horse. So, I I don't think it was all speculation that this was a, a mobbed up establishment. Now, that yeah. doesn't mean that Rick uh, Rizzolo or Rizzolo was, was, uh, was a mobster. Sure. But uh, I, I am, um, I, I, I'll side with informants that claim that he was a mob associate and he was beholden to the guys in Chicago. I don't think any of his own money really went into that strip club. I think back in the eighties when it was moved and, and renamed the crazy horse two and everything. And that was, you know, 1984. I mean, it was two years before Spilato died. So, you know, Chicago still had a stranglehold and a vice grip on that territory. I wonder about the strip clubs today in Vegas. Like if there are any of them are mobbed up. I have no, I, I don't think they I, have are. No, I, I, I have no idea. I, I, that's what I'm I saying. I haven't been to Vegas that, that, in, I can't remember 12 years. It's been a while. That's why I think, People made such a big deal of the Crazy Horse 2 being so mobbed up, allegedly. It was the last. It uh, was the last real business in Las Vegas. I mean, yeah. I don't, maybe not the last, but one of the last that had supreme control by organized crime. I mean, now all those casinos are all corporate. I mean, you, even if you wanted to try to shake down a casino, you couldn't. Well, I'll tell you what, or the, steal the last the time I was in Vegas, I took out money from the ATM and it was a $25 yeah. fee. Right. And I said it was better when the mob controlled yeah. it because <laughs> you'd pay less interest <laughs> from a mafia loan shark than a goddamn $25 fee. But anyhow, well, this was a good show. We'll wrap up here. We're always happy to talk about the outfit in Las Vegas. Hopefully more topics on this soon. Uh, again, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please spread the word. Uh, people on YouTube have said it's a crime that we don't have more subscriptions, and I agree. Yeah. So please spread the word. This is grassroots, right? Please spread the word, and uh, please follow us on social media. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. I'm Scott Bernstein. And we're out. Yeah.